Our Father in heaven, as we come together in, on the Sabbath and the dawning hours of the Sabbath, or beginning of it, we're together to learn of you, to be taught of you. Father, I thank you for the writings that you give us, pioneer writings and spirit of prophecy, and especially your scripture. Make it come alive to us tonight, this evening, that we can see it as you intended us to see it, to discern it, to understand, to add understanding to, to the wisdom and knowledge that you impart to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, this this past week, I came across this, uh, it was a YouTube logarithm pick that was suggested. So I listened to it. I've listened to it quite a few times since then. It's so much in it. And it's by J.N. Loughborough, the great Second Advent Movement, 1905. And one of the things, the main thing that caught my attention will come up later in the uh, probably second or third page, I think. This is chapter six of that book, The Message and the Messengers. Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry. Wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven, and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. Those who gave the Advent proclamation claimed that this vision with its appointed time mentioned by the prophet Habakkuk included the visions of the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelator. These they made so plain in their delineations of them upon their prophetic charts that he who read the interpretation could indeed run and impart the information to others. A definite message the proclamation by the Adventist people was not simply the announcement made by Paul through Felix, righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Nor was it the statement made by Martin Luther after having completed the translation of the Bible when a short time before his death, he was reported to have said, I am persuaded that the judgment is not far off. The day that the Lord himself will not be absent above 300 years longer. Neither was it the statement made by John Wesley when he said the thought of the millennium might commence in about 100 years. The Adventists claimed to be giving the message symbolized in Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. The hour of his judgment is come. And the cry of Revelation 10, verse 6, time shall be no longer. Such a prophecy could not be accomplished by an announcement of an event that was to come coming in 300 years or in 100 years, but in definite time, is come. Just such a message with just such definiteness as that demanded by the above prophecies was heralded by the Adventist people to the whole world. The judgment at Christ's coming. At the time this message was first announced, every Christian denomination held that the judgment would take place at the second coming of Christ. So a people under those circumstances, giving the message of the hour of judgment come, while holding the view that it would necessarily proclaim the second coming of Christ. In fact, that which gave force to the message, and most mightily moved the people, was the proclamation of definite time. First, they claimed that the end of the world would come sometime during the Jewish year, 1843, and that this was embraced in the time between 
March 21, 1843, and March 21, 1844. After this time passed by, we learn in the midnight cry of the year 1844 that a definite day was fixed upon for the termination of the prophetic times. This was the tenth day of the seventh Jewish month, corresponding to October 22nd, 1844. Okay, just a comment here, if I can. Yes, anytime. anytime. Yeah, so just about, so originally, so Lothborough, of course, is a bit later. He's he's not, not really, uh, you know, part of the movement prior to, because I can't remember how old he is in 1844, but I think his family was involved and he was a child. If I remember correctly, he was younger anyway. So some of the information that he has is it, he just he doesn't have personal knowledge of it. So originally they had fixed the time to the year 1843, which would have been January 1st, December 31st. Then in December of 1842, after the 1843 chart was made, for the first time Miller says that it's going to be March 21st, 1843 to March 21st, 1844. And that's because he has a bit of a misunderstanding of how the calendar works. He's just actually giving the spring equinox. Uh, and later then they they settle on the the end of the prophetic period as or for Miller as being April 19th or technically sunset on April 18th. So most most people believe that the first disappointment happened on March 21st, but it didn't was actually in April, about a month later. So it's just a little detail that uh, yeah, we need to know. Uh, and when was it again in April, the date? You... April 19th is the first day of the first month. So on, on the evening of April 18th mm-hmm. at sunset, Miller's mm-hmm. prophecy had passed, though they waited till the morning in, um, mm-hmm. to be that it had passed, hmm. um, right? So April 19th is the first disappointment. How many but, Adventists were, how many Adventists at that time, all, of, all Adventists at that time that were Millerites, I guess? Okay, so there was 500,000 Millerites prior to 1844. Now, there was a progression of people dropping off um, some people mm-hmm. after December 31st, 1843, left the message because to them that was the mm-hmm. end of 1843. Uh, some people hung on till March 21st, 1844. Not everyone who was following the Millerites understood that the Jewish year ended on April 19th. Um, so a greater mm-hmm. number fell away. At, at the first disappointment, which was April 19th. And the movement moved to about 50,000 from 500,000, so only one-tenth um, mm-hmm. were, received the blessing of the 1335 so that they were able to receive the second angel's message. And then Ellen White gives the number, back in about 1850, the number of people who had still continued to follow the message and receive the new light to be about 50. That went from 500,000 mm-hmm. to 50,000, and then to 50 people. Mm-hmm. That ratio is what, one in a thousand? Well, yeah, from from 50,000 to 50, that's one in... Uh, no, I'm, the progressive or, ratio. Or, from the whole thing, it's one in a thousand. Uh, that would be one in mm. 10,000. In 10,000. Okay, okay. I'm yeah. Math, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And again, uh, people take that number literally, and it's not a literal number. It, it is. What do they call that uh, illustration? Or, uh, which which number are you talking about? Uh, to make a comparison of something, or to use an illustration to illustrate a, a relative outcome like one in a 
million isn't really one in a million when we say that. We're saying that it's a huge chance. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so what do they call that with when it goes from uh, people say, well, it's going to be only one in a thousand that will be saved, the Adventists, but it's not actually a literal, got to count them. In not literal. Right, not literal. right. And I've seen that sidetracked. Hmm. Where are we at now? Should I carry on? Any other comments? Questions? Reckoning of the 2300 days. The basis of the time, 1843, was the 2300 days of Daniel 8. It was claimed that as these days were connected with prophecies where beasts, where beasts were chosen to represent kingdoms, Days must be used symbolically to represent years, according to the Lord's interpretation of symbolic time as given in Numbers 14, verse 34, and Ezekiel 4, verses 5 and 6. That the, 20, that the 70 weeks, 490 days of Daniel 9, were to be the first part of the 2300 days, and that, and that the two periods began together. The event given in Daniel 9, which marked the beginning of the 70 weeks, was the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. That commandment went forth in the 70th year of Artaxerxes Longimanus, 457 B.C., as recorded in Ezra 7. Now, is, is that date? Did we come up with a different 458, 457? Okay, so just generally... Adventists did not or do not have a specific time that the commandment goes into effect. So the going forth of the commandment is in the spring of 457, uh, because the passage itself, uh, the going forth of the commandment, the return of the people, and to build. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and so it's actually a three-step proclamation, but most people just read it as the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build. But the word restore means actually the, refers to the return of the people on the first day of the fifth month. And then the to build is that period of time in which the civil authority is set up from the first day of the fifth month to, uh, or you could say from the, the uh, fourth day of the fifth month, because that's actually when they bring the gold and silver to the temple, and then uh, three days after they arrive, and then there's three days before the 20th day of the ninth month that uh, we can tell the civil power is in effect. The center of that is the 10th day of the seventh month. So the 10th day of the seventh month is actually the start of the 2300 days in the 70 weeks. And uh, that's just how long, generally how not... Long? Nailed down. What is the total length of period for the three proclamations or the three decrees? Okay. Uh, so going back to Cyrus's decree? Yeah, in, there in, three, in, right, so that, right? So that's going to be on April 23rd, 536 B.C. So you can see that that period of time from 536 to 457 is a period of... Um, 80 years, basically. Right. Hmm. So that's the total time span between from one to three is 80 years? Yeah, yeah, 80 years. Yeah. So right. there's there's okay, three steps in the three different decrees. There's Cyrus, Artaxerxes, and Artaxerxes decrees. There's three decrees. And then in the third decree, there's three steps. The going forth of the commandment in the spring, mm. the return of the people on the first day of the fifth month, and then... Uh, the, the the building that to build, which is actually not referring to the physical building of the city or the temple, because the temple's already been built, mm. and it's not going to be until part of the 20th year that they actually build the street and walls. Um, so that's going to be okay. later. Well, it's interesting that there's a three and three there. Mm -hmm. But most Adventists just have no idea about 457. They just think that the commandment is given in the fall of 457, but it would actually have been given before Ezra leaves Babylon 
right? And he leaves in the spring. So the so the, mm, yeah. so the commandment has to be issued earlier. Let me forget how much logistics are involved to make a journey even that long and far. Yeah, well, it's four, sure yeah, how long four months. What would it have taken? Four months. Well, four months. Four months. So they leave to, on the first get, day of the first yeah. month, get there on the first day of the fifth month. So that's four months. And we see the same thing, too, under Cyrus's decree, because his decree is going to be on April 23rd. And then they're going to arrive in, in, in probably the sixth month because they have to get ready to go. And then they're going to set up an altar on the mm. first day of the seventh month in 536. So it, it takes them, you know, probably three, four months to get to uh, uh, to Jerusalem. It's really nice to have those details. To get, It really fills in the picture. Mm -hmm. um, where are we now? We're reckoning of the 2300. Where did I leave off? I'm sorry. Oh, these days. Yeah, you're on uh, that. This was the true date. The second paragraph there. Second. Oh, yes. Thank you. Maybe scroll the page up to the to that line. Help me keep track. Thank you. But this was the true date for the beginning of the 70 weeks. It was demonstrated by the fact that in just 69 weeks, 483 years, from 457, or in AD 27, Christ was baptized by John and entered upon his ministry, saying, The time is fulfilled. The opening of the ministry of Christ, AD 27, his crucifixion, three and a half years from that date, in the midst, in the middle of the 70th week, the close of the special work among the Jews, A.D. 34, and the speedy conversion of Saul, the apostle to the Gentiles, proved that the 70 weeks did terminate at that date, and therefore they began in B.C. 457. They figured the matter out thus, from 2300, take 457, and there remains 1843. And as the 457 years were before Christ, we are brought for the close of the 2300 days. For I think it's a mistype. We are brought forward to the close of the 2300 days of 1843. Admissions of opponents. It has been truthfully said that the admission, admissions in favor of truth from the ranks of its opponents furnish the highest kind of evidence. None of the opponents of the Advent message ever in intimated that the investigative judgment of the Lord's people was an event to take place before Christ's coming, but reasoned upon this point in harmony with the Adventists. As proof of this statement, we quote from two prominent opponents. Mr. N. Clover, preaching in Marlboro Street Chapel, Boston, 1843, in opposition to the Adventists, said, if these days are years, the world will end in 1843. Any schoolboy can see it. For if 490 terminated at the death of Christ, the 2300 days would terminate in 1843. And the world must end unless it can be shown that some other event is to take place. And I do not see how that can be done. Professor Stewart, about the same time, said, It is a singular fact that the great mass of interpreters in, in the English and American world would have, for many years, been wont to understand the days designated in Daniel. Daniel and the Apocalypse, that's where it is. Wont to understand the days designated in Daniel and the Apocalypse as a representation or symbols of years. I found it difficult to trace the origin of this general, I might say, almost universal custom. Professor Bush's testimony. Pro Professor Bush said, whoever attacks Mr. Miller on this point of time, attacks him on his strongest point. His time is right, but he is mistaken in the event to occur. Bush was a believer in the conversion of the whole world before the coming of Christ. His theory was that the millennium would begin in 1844. The ministers of the Advent faith taught in their public discourses that the world's history showed the various nations to be in just the condition symbolized by the image of Daniel II. 
when the stone was to smite the image on the feet. And the God of heaven set up his kingdom. And in chapter 7, when the kingdom and dominion and greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the saints of the Most High. They also called attention to the fact that the signs, physical, political, and moral, were just what the scriptures foretold would be seen when the Lord was about to appear. One is in the heavens. The Lord, through the prophet Joel, says, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. The Adventists believed and taught that the aurora borealis of the last centuries, commonly called northern lights, was the fire and pillars of smoke that meets the specification of the prophet. And from the best information to be obtained from history, we refer to the Edinburgh Encyclopedia as testimony. It had rarely been seen previous to this period. So while the message of the Lord's speedy coming was going to the remotest parts of the earth, signs were hung out in the heavens which gave edge to the truth and arrested the attention of the people. On January 25th, 1837, there was a most magnificent display of the fiery aurora borealis, which seemed to lead the minds of many directly to the prophet Joel's prediction of what was to precede the great day of the Lord. The following description of the scene is from the New York Commercial Advertiser of October 22, 1839. It agrees exactly with the scene as the writer witnessed it in Victor, Ontario County, New York, the fiery aura, aurora of 1837. On the evening of January 25th, 1837, there was a remarkable exhibition of the same phenomena, meaning the aurora borealis, in various parts of the country, as our readers will doubtless recollect. Where the ground was covered with snow, the sight was grand and fearful in a most unprecedented manner. In one place, situated near a mountain, the people who witnessed the scene informed us that it resembled waves of fire rolling down the mountain, and generally, so far as learn, learned, learned, the snow covering the ground appeared like fire mingled with blood, while above, as the apostle says, the heavens beam on fire resembled so much the prophetic description of the last day that many were amazed. The children beholding it were affrighted and inquired if it were the coming of the judgment, and even the animals trembled with such, with much manifest alarm. It was not alone in America that this sign of the prophet Joel was displayed, but as the doctrine of the Lord's coming was gaining publicity in Great Britain, the same sign was hung out in the heavens in that country. The New York Commercial Advertiser of October 22, 1839, quotes the following from Lon London Papers concerning a remarkable phenomena witnessed in that country on the night of September 3, 1839. The Aurora of 1839, London, September 5th. Between the hours of 10 on Thursday night and 3 yesterday morning, in the heavens was observed one of the most magnificent specimens of these extraordinary phenomena, the falling stars and northern lights, witnessed for many years past. The first indication of this singular phenomena was 10 minutes before 10, when a light crimson apparently vapor rose from the northern portion of the hemisphere and gradually extended to the center of the heavens, and by 10 o'clock or a quarter past, the whole from east to west was one vast sheet of light. It, was, it had a most alarming appearance and was exactly like that occasioned by a terrific fire. The light varied considerable. At one time it seemed to fall, and directly after rose with intense brightness. There were to be seen mingled with it volumes of smoke, which rolled over and over, and every beholder seemed convinced that it was a tremendous conflagration. That conflagra conflagration... There's a word for great fires that are destroying fires. Is that about right? Yeah. Yeah, it's just a, a fire. 
conflagration. Yeah, big fire, but uh, seems to be connected with. To Sister White speaks about these conflagrations that will be a sign of the end. Yeah. Anyone uh, familiar with forest fires? Or hur- we know that hurricanes are given a class one, two, three, and so on, earthquakes and such. Uh, forest fires are given a class of one, one to five. And a, f- a class five fire, I've only seen it on film in training for, uh, as a forest tech. So I'm thinking of it. But a, a conflagration, to me, what I see is this film that I saw of a class five fire. The, the heat is so intense, the fire is advancing so quickly. As it, as it goes forward, it consumes the oxygen in front of it and literally pulls 30, 40, 60 foot trees out of the ground into the fire before it, as it advances. That's how I picture what a conflagration is. The consternation of the metropolis was very great. Thousands of persons were running in the direction of the supposed awful catastrophe. The engines belonging to the fire brigade stations in Baker Street, Farringdon Street, Watling Street, Waterloo Road, and likewise those belonging to the west of London stations. In fact, every fire engine in London was horsed and galloped after the supposed scene of destruction with more than ordinary energy, followed by carriages, horsemen, and vast mobs. Some of the engines proceeded as far as Highgate and Halloway, before about four miles before the error was discovered. These appearances lasted for upwards of two hours, and toward morning the spectacle became one of grandeur. At two o'clock in the morning, the phenomena presented a most gorgeous scene, and one very difficult to describe. The whole of London was illuminated as light as noonday, and the atmosphere was remarkably clear. The southern hemisphere, at the time mentioned, though unclothed, was very dark, but the stars which were innumerable, shone beautifully. The opposite side of the heavens presented a singular but mo- but magnificent contrast. It was clear to the extreme, and the light was very vivid. There was a continual succession of meteors, which varied in splendor. They appeared formed in the center of the heavens and spread till they seemed seemed to burst. The effect was electrical. Myriads of small stars shot out over the horizon and darted with such swiftness toward the earth that the eye could scarcely scarcely follow the track. They seemed to burst also and throw a dark crimson vapor over the entire hemisphere. The colors were most magnificent. At half past two o'clock, the spectacle changed to darkness, which, on dispersing, displayed a luminous rainbow in the zenith of the heavens and around and round the edge of round the ridge of darkness that overhung the southern portion of the country. Soon afterward, columns of silvery light radiated from it. They increased wonderfully, intermingled among crimson vapor, which formed at the same time. And when at full height, the spectacle was beyond all imagination. Stars were darting darting about in all directions and continued until four o'clock when all died away. Strange appearances in the sun. While the living preachers were setting forth the truth of the Lord's coming, many and varied wonders in the heavens were seen in the various parts of the world. Of these, our space will permit only the representation of the appearance of the sun in Norwich, England, in December 1843. A similar one occurred in New Haven, Connecticut, September 9, 1844. For two hours before and afternoon, and was witnessed by thousands of people. Strange appearance of the sun. The uh, the small inner circle represents the sun. It was a light orange hue. The outer part of the two circles of unequal distance form uh, form and surrounding the sun appeared of the same hue, but the inner part of these circles was a deep yellow, 
the sky within these circles appearing of a dusky brown color, and the three large circles passing through and below the sun appeared as a distinct bright light. I'd like to draw a picture of that, to imagine it. Who's our artist? <laughs> Sounds like quite a, a pattern. Of the occurrence in England, we read in a letter from E. Lloyd, London, January 3, 1844, as follows. There has been a remarkable sign in the sun, seen by the principal citizens of Norwich and the surrounding country, such as has never been seen in England before. It was seen in December last, about 12 o'clock at noon, and continued for two hours. It very much alarmed the inhabitants. It occurred just before Brethren Winter, Burgess, and Wooten, Routen opened their mission in that city. It seemed to prepare the way for the truth, so that they met with good success there. The account of the phenomena, as it occurred in New Haven, Connecticut, is given in the midnight cry of October 10, 1844, and was taken from the New Haven Palladium of September 10, 1844. In the account of the cry, the editor says, No philosopher has been able to give an explanation of the cause of this phenomena, which satisfies himself. An account of this site, which appeared in connection with the sun in New Haven, was also published in the Hartford Courant of September 12, 1844, and reads as follows. The rings around the sun on Monday, September 9, for two hours before and after midday, appear to have been generally observed by our citizens with much interest and have awakened an intelligent curiosity to learn more respecting respecting appearances of the same kind and their cause. The present halo was remarkable for its duration and afforded favorable opportunities for observation. About midday, it consisted chiefly of two complete rings, one about 45 degrees in breadth, encircling the sun at its center, and the other about 72 degrees broad, having its center in the zenith, while its circumstances circumference passed through the sun. The smaller circle was accompanied by an eclipse of the major axis and of small eccentricity. Directly opposite the sun and 36 degrees north of the zenith, the large circle was intersected by two other circles of nearly or quite the same diameter, forming at the point of intersection a bright spot such as would naturally result from the combined light of three luminous rings. The ring that encircled the sun exhibited the colors of the rainbow, frequently, frequently with much vividness and beauty. The other rings were white and fainter, as they were more distant from the sun. Small portions of circles, however, with prismatic rainbow hues, appeared at different times, both in the east and west. That sounds like a description of the of sun dogs, which we know in, in cold winters. Such uniformity of structure must depend on some law which regulates the formation of halos. But the nature of the law is not fully developed. Not much difficulty has been experienced in accounting for the production of the rain that encircles the sun, since the cause is somewhat similar to that which produces the rainbow. But to explain the origin of the ring, which has its circumference in the sun's center, has been found more difficult. Of the use that was made, both in England and America, of these wonders seen in the heavens, we may learn by reading from the exposition of the 24th of Matthew by Sylvester Bliss, published in Boston in 1843. After quoting some of the above accounts, Sylvester Bliss says, Thus the great signs and fearful sights that are predicted in the scriptures of truth seem to be all fulfilled, as well as those which the Savior declared would should precede his coming. As soon as the leafing, uh, leaving out of the trees is an indication, as sure as the leaving out of the trees is an indication of summer, just so sure on the fulfillment of these signs are Christians to know that the coming of Christ is near 
even at the door. It is not a mere permission to know it, but our Savior commands them to know it. The Messengers Having called attention to some of the leading features, uh, actually, I think I'm just going to stop there for a second and refer to something else about the the auroras, accounts of the auroras, also by uh, Jan Loughborough, 1904, Jan Loughborough, LDT, what would that stand for, LDT? Someone will find it. Right. I can try to find it. out. So that is a book by J. N. Loughborough. Yeah, it would be in the writings of the pioneers. Yeah, I'll, the... I'll just carry on reading from it. It's uh yeah, it's uh fourteen point two L D T fourteen point three. Fifteen point one actually. Last, Last day, day token. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so they use the word tokens to refer to things like uh, harbinger, harbingers, or um, there's another word the other one uses. Um, but yeah, signs of Christ's coming. So the last day tokens. And he actually has a chapter called Last Day Tokens. It goes through mm -hmm. different signs. So this, this one. I'll try and highlight stuff. So the Lord, the day of the Lord cometh, wonders in the heavens, increase. Mather's testimony, J.B. Felt's testimony, testimony of Willard's history. Aurora in 1789. Aurora of January 25th, 1837. Those were Australia. Aurora in London. 1839, Aurora of November 14, 1837, Aurora of March 1852, Aurora in Australia in 1900 and 1909. So I, somewhere in here, and I wish I would have marked it. I can search for you, Kelly. So what is it you want to find? Um, well, I, I have it here somewhere. It was uh, okay. Yeah, uh, JNL uh, LDT. I have a hard copy. LDT twenty one point one. Okay. But, uh, okay. The mo I'll just jump in here without the clear. Well, actually, LDT eighteen point three. Last day tokens eighteen point three. Nineteen oh four. The most unaccountable of all the circumstances respecting the aurora borealis is not much more than a century since it, oh, sorry, let me start over. The most unaccountable of all the circumstances respecting the aurora borealis is that it is not much more than a century since this phenomena has been observed with any degree of frequency in our latitudes. We find, indeed, Atmospheric phenomena recorded by the ancients, which may be regarded as examples of this meteor, but with trifling exceptions, the whole of antiquity is absolutely silent on the subject. Dr. Haley of London, England, informs us that he had begun to despair of witnessing this beautiful phenomena when the remarkable aurora of 1716 made its appearance. The philosopher has given us historical detail of the several observations of this meteor, in which he says in the first of it on record in an English work in a book titled A Description of Meteors by WFDD, reprinted at London in 1654, which speaks of burning spears being seen January 30, 1560. He, he says in this book that the next appearance of a like kind is recorded by Stowe and was and occurred on October 7, 1564. In 1574, according to Stowe and Camden, an aurora was seen for two successive nights, the 14th and 15th of November. The same phenomenon was twice seen in Bar Bra Brabant in 1575 on the 13th of February and the 28th of September, 
and the circumstances accompanying it were described by Cornelius Gemma, who compares them to spears, fortified cities, and an army fighting in the air. In 1580 and 1581, this phenomena was repeatedly observed at Brackrang in the con- county of Württemberg in Germany. But from this till 1621, we have no such <clears throat> excuse me. We have no such phenomena on record when it was seen all over France on September 2nd, and is particularly described by Gassendi in his Physics under the title of Aurora Borealis. In November 1623, another was seen all over Germany, and it particularly and is particularly described by Kepler. Since that time, for more than 80 years, we have no account of any such phenomena being observed. In 1707, Mr. Neve observed one of short continuance in Ireland, and in the same year, a similar appearance was seen by Romer at Copenhagen, while during an interval of 18 months in the years 1707 and 1708. This sort of light had been seen no less than five times. The aurora of 1716, which Dr. Haley particularly describes, was remarkably brilliant. It was also visible over a prodigious tract of country, being seen from the west of Ireland to the confines of Prussia and the east of Poland, extending nearly 30 degrees of longitude, about 1,800 miles east and west, and from the 50th degree of north latitude, over almost all of north of Europe, about 800 miles, north and south, 800 by 1800, and in all places, exhibiting at the same time appearances similar to those observed in London. It appears then to be certainly established that the aurora was of rare occurrence in our latitude until about a century ago, for it cannot be supposed that so beautiful and striking a phenomena would have passed unnoticed and unrecorded during the two preceding centuries, while men of science, in particular astronomers, were so busily employed in examining every remarkable appearance of the heavens, or that the philosophers of Greece and Rome would have remained silent concerning so beautiful meteor, had it been in any degree familiarly known to them. It is in vain to account for their silence by saying that they inhabited Germany and, oh, sorry, that they inhabited latitudes which are scarcely ever visited by these appearances, for the Romans not only visited it, but long resided in the north of Germany and Britain, where the aurora is now frequently seen in great splendor. The above details from the encyclopedia show that the aurora, especially in its crimson and fiery display, is of modern, modern date. That uh, jumped off the page, kind of all that information about Aurora Borealis being new to this cent- century or last couple centuries, last few. And the, and the one that caught the world's attention recently in, in April, was it? April something. So, I mean, it caught the world's attention. Now, where's those stars to fall, I guess, but that's something. But, uh, Surely, you know, God's trying to get the world's attention. Like the creator, what a display of the northern lights. And and then to uh, <clears throat> people attribute it to man, made by various devices that they've invented. That, that's a long reach. So, what do you guys think? Is this information helpful? I find it most interesting. Yeah, so, well, the Aurora Borealis and, and the Aurora Australis, mm-hmm. I'm not sure if I quite uh, agree with his historical account of that it's only recently been seen. And that's so, why I want you to look at it, because you're the <laughs> chronological historicist, or, or you're good at it. Yeah. I track that down. Because yeah, so, I, I really do want to fact check this. That's quite quite amazing to say that it only started and what changed 
don't let the yeah, environmentalists well, get, get a hold of that. Yeah, I don't know if there has been a change. I mean, obviously in the past, I mean, everything that was recorded hasn't survived. Right? So, and, you know, it's like saying we get a lot more picture, uh, photos of uh, events nowadays than we did 50 years ago because everybody has a cell phone, right? So it, a very few things it's, were recorded. It was very few people to record things, I, you know. But yet, he does make a good point there that such spectacular displays in the heavens would would have been mentioned, I would think. Like, it stopped people in the street. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but then it has to be recorded by somebody, and that record has to be carried on. So uh, if you mm -hmm. don't have, you know, so how many documents from the past actually survived? Uh, even from Roman history, mm -hmm. not really very many, and and often even a lot of the famous you know, Greek and Roman writers, we just have quotes of their material that were notable things that they said, not everything they recorded. But we don't have the newspapers from, uh, you know, that history, for instance, because there wasn't any. Um, so. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think I actually have I've looked into this in the past and I'm trying to find it. But you know, the Chinese mm -hmm. know things in the past. Yeah. But I'd have to get some more information on it. So just to show you, so I'm trying to find that. Um you, obviously they must you bring up the Ch Chinese. North. Yeah. You bring up the Ch Chinese so, uh God, God in China. There's actually a Man from Australia, mm -hmm. maybe you'll, maybe you'll bump into him. Uh, God in China was the is his uh, presentation or series, and uh, mm -hmm. the, the Chinese were the emperor was Christian, the, the first one. I can't remember his name, but it was a Christian kingdom. God was in yeah. the Bible. Well, we see it in the characters, right? Is this is this true, or is yes. this just we, yes, this is we true. Do it, you know, so I've done lots of research. The letter on symbol this. for the garden is a tree and two people, or something. Yeah, a boat. Uh, a symbol for a flood is an ark with eight people. With eight. Yeah, that yeah. would be the word. Salvation is a boat with eight people in it. Something like so, that. If, so, okay, I thought it was flood, but you know. Yeah, but, uh, I think it's yeah. So God, God was. Uh, but the thing that's interesting about it, the thing that's interesting about the Chinese, though, is, is just their conception of God in the past, because uh, they have a word that's similar to uh, you know what's translated as the Most High in uh, um, you know etymologically speaking, it could be I think they call it Shangdi or something like that. Yeah, um, that's the name. Yeah. He was actually so, an emperor. So, so they seem to have a conception of of uh of God, you know, in, in very early writings. But also it's quite clear that they were Sabbath keepers before the Catholics came and the Catholics converted mm. them to Sunday keepers. Um and the guy mm. who had done this research was um James Arabito. Remember him? Okay, yeah, yeah. Yep. So he did research. He traveled in in China and different places and did research, finding the documentation to show that China was a Christian nation at one time and also a Sabbath keeping Christian nation. But yeah, the Chinese record the Northern Lights as early as the 10th century BC. So that's you know obviously okay three thousand years ago, and the Assyrians so got record the Northern. The Assyrians record them um, about uh, in about the ninth century BC. Hmm. So they have. See how them. easy that was. <laughs> Google. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. the claim that, but the displays can we give it any any kind of merit or well, whatever weight? You know, that it think, happened you know, around to, the time of the falling stars you know, to, and the proclamation of the Second Advent. Yeah, well, there's so many different astronomical phenomena that the people are going to, uh, I mean, 
I believe that God allows this as a witness to them, right? You know, some people dismiss it. Well, we now know why these things are caused and they didn't understand it. But the thing is, there was just lots of it, right? There was lots of things happening. Mm-hmm. And, and so the significance there is that the people saw it as significant and it did open up their hearts and minds to the gospel and to the idea that Christ was coming soon. Just because we can explain why these things happen doesn't mean they're not signs in the heavens. Yeah. I, I, you mentioned the multitude does lend weight as well. I mean, people yeah. say, well, we just have newspapers, so that's why we see more of them, but not really. The, the frequency yeah, well, you know, and, and the Aurora is Borealis, like increasing. We saw recently, the Aurora Borealis that we saw recently, I mean, was pretty pretty extensive and pretty dramatic. Uh, I didn't see it personally. Uh, you did, right? Some of it. Yeah. Yes, yes I did, some of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I we, it was yeah. it was a little bit east of me, so it wasn't directly overhead, but yeah. Okay. But I, I've actually yeah. seen the Aurora Borealis directly ahead, just as described in this article, as if bursting from the center. Yeah. It was a morning at uh, 1978 at Canadian Union College at the Seventh Day Adventist School there. One morning walking to class. Yeah, I was late for class. <laughs> I've seen them as well, you know, quite. But this one's a lot more spectacular than any that I had seen, at least based on the photos, especially the colors, because I've seen lots of green with a little mm. bit of orange on it. But this one was, you know, lots of very purples and. Was it the time time of year in Banff, 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 Banff Island? Did you see them up there when you were hiking? I've never seen them hiking, no. Okay. And I, I never saw them when I was up in Banff Island either. But, of course, that was in the summer and it didn't get dark. <laughs> so, I mean, we know what causes mm-hmm. the solar flares. Um and you know they they happen in in sort of regular cycles the the solar flares but you have to get hit the mm-hmm. right way in order for it to get those spectacular electromagnetic effects in the upper atmosphere. My my thought mentioning that that it is just we know what it is solar flares and so on is that a physicist or a scientist would lo- like to step in here and explain the laws of physics and so on. They fail to figure well, out it's who, who, who made those laws. On the sun's surface, right? The so one about the sun see. was interesting, though. The, the circles and... Um, I don't know. I'm sure they have an yeah. explanation for it somewhere as well. Yeah, but those probably would be just um, sort of have to do with the atmosphere and the ice crystals and so forth. I don't know. I, I didn't see it. So I'd have to see mm-hmm. it, you know. I, well, that's why I was saying I'd like someone to draw a picture of what was described there. Just, you know, describing the picture and draw it out according to the description would be helpful. But I think all these signs are still relevant, even though we can explain them. Um, you know, for instance, in my life, personally, the day I was converted, you know, was uh, August 11th, 1980, during the Perseid meteor shower. And that oh, meteor yeah. shower was the most spectacular Perseid meteor shower in recorded history. Um, and I saw it at its height. But there was not a moment mm. that was not a falling star. So, and, and I was an ideal. I was in 100 miles, you see. So, ideal location. During the new moon, there's no light pollution, and uh, mm. you know, so for me, it's, it's obviously significant. I don't think it was just chance that I was converting on that date, especially since it's August 11th, and mm-hmm. the number number of days from my conversion to July 18th is the same number of days that the manna fell. So I don't know if you uh, heard. I don't know if you heard me relate about the day I was converted. It was mm-hmm. uh, the day, yeah. it was the night before Stephen invited me to stay with you, your family. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, I heard you. I listened to the testimony there. Yeah, I came across this. What's that? I came across this uh, one of those uh, dog-eared, faded paper booklets of prophecy picked up at a book sale somewhere. Spirit of Prophecy Treasure Chest. It's uh, put together by The Voice of Prophecy, uh, 1960. We share a few things from that before we end. I think it will be helpful. This is a message, a message from Sister White. We are homeward bound a little longer and the strife will be over. May we who stand in the heat of the conflict ever keep before us a vision of things unseen of that time when the world will be bathed in the light of heaven, when the years will move on in gladness. When over the scene the morning stars will sing together and the sons of God will shout for joy, while God and Christ will unite in proclaiming, There shall be no more sin, neither shall there be any more death. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, let us press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. Signed Ellen G. White. It's a reproduction of a autographed message placed by Ellen White in gift copies of her book. So this was the... We we all, I think, run into the conversations this topic of why all the testimonies were not reprinted and uh, the ideas that people come up with for reasons. This is uh, written, or this is a Again, drawn from the Spirit of Prophecy Treasure Chest, Prophetic Guidance School of the Voice of Prophecy, copyright 1960 by the Alan G. White Estate. Between the years 1855 and 1864, ten numbered pamphlets appeared, each bearing the title Testimony for the Church. As the earlier numbers were not available at the publishing house, Mrs. White set about to arrange for their republication. The first reprinting of the testimonies was in the last portion of the spiritual of spiritual gifts, volume four, late in eighteen sixty four. But not all of that which was which constituted the first ten numbers of the testimonies was included. This fact, with the reason for the deletions, was stated by Mrs. White in her remarks, which formed a foreword to the testimony section of Spiritual Gifts, Volume Four. During the last I have written ten small pamphlets entitled Testimony for the Church, which have been published and circulated among Seventh-day Advent. The first edition of most of these pamphlets being exhausted and there being an increasing demand for them, it has been thought best to reprint them as given in the following pages, omitting local and personal matters, giving those of practical and general interest and most of the testimony most of testimony number four may be found in the second volume the spiritual gifts it is omitted in this volume the significance of the that was taken in this first reprinting of the testimonies and of this statement written by Ellen White is clear these testimonies were presentation of messages from heaven Yet she pointed out that certain of these articles were, by their very nature, not necessary to all church members for all time. So in 1864, reprinting of the testimonies, only those were selected which seemed to be of general interest and importance. The first 10 pamphlets of the testimonies totaled about 450 pages. After Mrs. White had made her extractions, only about a third of the original content remained and was reprinted in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4. The question might properly be asked whether she, as the Lord's Messenger, was working within her rights when she omitted, in reprints, a part of that which had previously been published as testimony for the Church. In considering this matter, keep in mind that not all the writings of the Bible prophets 
were preserved in the Bible for general reading for all time. And we may reasonably conclude that the Bible, that the books mentioned, but not included in the Bible, and the messages of prophets who were named, but he did not contribute to the scripture canon, were of immediate importance to the people living at the time, and that they were <clears throat> at the time that they were written. However, being local in character, they were not needed for all time, and were, with good reason, not included in the scriptures. <clears throat> Mrs. White exercised good judgment in her general subsequent years, when Miss White selected for permanent use in one of her books the more general portions of a testimony issued, originally in pamphlet form, and directed to a certain church, members of a church or institution. An illustration of this is found in the articles in the early part of Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, being such portions of message to the Battle Creek Church, published in a pamphlet entitled Testimony to the Battle Creek Church, as Mrs. White understood, would be of service to the church generally. She did not include in Volume 5 for wide use in permanent form those portions of the pamphlet which were very personal or local in application. Although the messages were given to her by the Lord, she carried very largely under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and with the counsel of her brethren the responsibility of deciding how to deliver those messages to individuals at the proper time and place. There have been down through the years to the present some persons who, do not, who, not understanding this matter, have concluded that the failure of Mrs. White to republic all time the personal or local portions of testimony as they were originally printed in pamphlets constitutes what they have termed suppression. The knowledge of the facts demonstrates such conclusions are groundless. Reprinted in full in 1871. But the record concerning the reprinting of the testimonies does not end here. Although Mrs. White was justified in 1864 in reissuing them in convention, when it was necessary to reprint the testimonies in in 1871, to meet the desire of our church members, they were reprinted in full. By this time, 19 testimony pamphlets had been issued, and the, had been, and the first 16 were put out in their entirety in two short, thick books, about 500 pages each. James White wrote the pref preface, and in it, it in just what was done. We reproduce this informative statement here. During the period of Mrs. Mrs. White was has published testimony to the church of pamphlets, which at this date number twenty. But as the editions of the first numbers were small and have long since been exhausted, we are not able to furnish the series complete to the numerous friends who subsequently embraced the views of Seventh day Adventists. The call for these testimonies being large, we republish them and offer them in this form. We are happy to do this, inasmuch as the testimonies given under the trying and ever-changing circumstances of the past 16 years, ever breathing the same high-toned spirit of scriptural piety, contain in themselves the best evidences of their being what they profess to be. There are in them matters of a local and personal character, which do not have a direct bearing upon our time. But as many have desired it, we give them complete. There are two points in this statement by Elder James White, which we note particularly. First, the evidence of the integrity of the testimonies. James White rejoiced that the testimony could be presented in their entirety, entirety because they always breathed the same high-toned spirit of scriptural piety, even though they were given under trying and ever-changing circumstances. Second, the subordinate place of local and personal testimonies. In response to the desire of many, those portions of the testimonies which had been omitted by Mrs. White in the first reprint were now restored. Yet in doing this, James White recognized, as did his wife when preparing the first reprint, 
that these local and personal portions did not have a direct bearing upon our time. As additional testimony, pamphlets were published from year to year, filled with counsels of importance to the church. They were in time drawn into the growing series of little black books until they numbered six in all. The record set forth above presents a sound background for the publication in 1949 of the selection of articles from the testimonies, which comprise the three volumes known as Testimony Treasures. It is vitally important that each Seventh-day Adventist shall be instructed, warned, guided, and encouraged by the testimony councils given expressly for the church. The massiveness of the nine volumes, with their nearly 6,000 pages, discourages consecutive reading to provide an easily compassed form of the crucial lines of instruction so important to each member of the worldwide church without his being burdened with repetition of instruction and with items of a local character, which may not have a direct bearing upon our times. The test have been issued. average family for a thoughtful and consecutive reading of the intimate and for the church these volumes are super and volume set of the testimonies is none need any do that basis for the world edition of the overseas. I thought that was a really good explanation. People that are concerned about not all the writings being up on that. Any concerns about the published writings, unpublished writings? It's, uh, how long ago was it that someone someone hacked the Ellen White estate and and got all the uh, those writings, and then 2015 or 2014, yeah. and then we we're going to publish them, and then so they published them on. Uh, was it what was the date they republished them around? It was was it Ellen the anniversary of Ellen White's death? Uh, I think it's the hundredth like, anniversary of her death. What? Yeah, so January or July 16th, uh, 2015. Right. They republished yeah. it. They, they released all of her unpublished right? The hacker caused a lot of work for the white estate. I mean, they weren't being hidden. It's just some of the. I, I think they had to be still at the same time respectful of privacy somehow. If they were. Uh, you know, well, took them so, well, took them so well, long. The thing about uh, the, you know what the, the the white estates was doing was working on releasing all the unpublished writing writings in um, uh, you know with comments and and background history. They oh. did publish volume one, but you know it takes mm. them so long to do. So there was just pressure to to get all of the unpublished writings released, which is good because we have her mentioning Leviticus twenty six in her unpublished right. writing um, and the seven times. So it was kind of nice to get that. It was, uh, would have been nice to get it sooner. But, um, was there, uh, who, who found that one? Was it Dwayne Dewey? Found what? That article in the unpublished writings? No. Uh, on, on where she talks about now you're talking Leviticus. about I mean, Dwayne Dewey found Hiram Edson's articles, mm -hmm. but the, I'm, I'm the one that found her re reference to Leviticus 26. I thought it was I, one of you. I'm not sure. You might be referring to something else. No, no, I, <clears throat> I'm. You've refreshed my memory. It was you. Yeah. I was okay. That. You are Dwayne. Yeah. What do we, uh, is it? Uh, hour and a half on Friday. What, well, what time do we, yeah, we can either an hour to an hour and a half. Okay. 
Well, I, I, I've got one last thing to share that I, I was able to find. One of the best descriptions of, uh, well, it's, I like it a lot. I like it a lot. And it is from Morris Vanden. So heads up on that. Other than that, it's from his book, Faith That Works. It's actually Theodore Turner's book. <laughs> I just opened the, I didn't, didn't notice that before. It's got your name written in the top corner. How do you like that? And then Kelly Lehan, February 16, 1982. You didn't date it when you wrote your name in it. How do you like that? I've had this book for a long time. Yeah. So it's called Jesus, cool. Jesus Your Bet. You remember it? I imagine. So December 31st, uh, Jesus, Your Best Friend, from that book, Faith That Works by Morris Sandman. And this is Life Eternal. This is kind of like a Vesper's reading. And this is Life Eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. John 17, verse 3. Do you know what it's like to be lonely? So alone that none but your own thoughts are do you know what it's like to, as a child, and meet only ridicule? Do you know what it's like to wish for a retreat in the quiet of your own home? But even there, find mocking and sarcasm. Do you know how it hurts to have no one to talk to, no one to share with, even if he only listens? Have you ever felt that you're disappointed? Have you ever been invited by someone to get acquainted and then had them come after dark so no one would see you together? Have you ever had people follow you everywhere so that they might something you say and justify putting you to death? Have you ever returned to your hometown, acquaintances, seeking to give friendship only to have rocks thrown at you? Have you ever given of yourself until there was nothing left to give? Have you struggled against all the forces of evil? And really, John, love from retaliating. Have you ever felt the sharp pain of thorns pressed deep into your scalp and temple? Have you ever had someone spit upon your bruised and bleeding face? How it feels to struggle through your own blood drops while dragging heavy timbers? Do you think you can drag your own willingly? Dying for those who hate, despise, and reject you? Have you ever felt the tearing crunch of nails being pounded through your hands and feet? Have you ever felt with every nerve the jolt of a cross dropping into its deep, ugly hole? Have you ever hung from wounds gaping ever wider while crowds taunted you and threw rocks at your lacerated body? Have you ever hurt? Have you ever suffered? Have you ever died alone for those who refuse to let you be their friend? While on this earth, Jesus did, and all the time, he longed for companionship and communion. He still does. Won't you be his friend? Theodore, would you mind closing in prayer for us? Okay. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the Sabbath for the blessings of fellowship and for the tokens in our experience and in the experience of the past and show that you uh, care for humanity and that you are giving us warnings about the things that are to come upon this earth. And we are thankful, Lord, Lord, for your Holy Spirit that speaks to us and brings that conviction and, and power uh, so that we can uh, come to you that you can live in us. We pray for each person searching for truth. We ask, Lord, that they can be drawn to you and that you can watch over them. We pray for our family and friends that this Sabbath can truly be a blessing, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.